This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Garth Stein, the writer of The Art of Racing in the Rain. There's some alliteration there that's giving me some trouble. Um, a film coming out this Friday, uh, August 12th. Um, story of a man, so no, August 10th, August 9th. August 9th. 9th. <laughs> Clearly, I don't know my dates. Calendars are not my... What uh, year is this, 1977? <laughs> I don't know. I'm clearly lost on that. Um, but it's the story of a man and a dog and the family that builds around them, so exactly. to speak. Um, I sort of want to start by talking about um, how this film has sort of reached people, because it's a really interesting cross-section of different sort of um, topics that I observed, and I was wondering sort of, there are obvious sort of clusters of like, oh, this will appeal to dog lovers, and this yeah. will appeal to racing lovers, and maybe yeah. family drama lovers. What is sort of your experience in terms of meeting the people who are fans of these films? What kind of clusters of individuals have sort of attach themselves and fallen in love with the story. Well, uh, what you just mentioned, right? I mean, the, the car people, car enthusiasts, racing enthusiasts um, are, are all attracted to it because it has something, you know, that they love. And uh, obviously the human drama, just, you know, that sort of thing. Dog people, they're crazy. You know, they are very passionate about the book. Um, and but I think that what's the reason that it works so well is because of the voice of Enzo the dog, mm -hmm. who's our narrator. And he is so endearing and so earnest and so clever and yet at the same time so limited in a sense because he's a dog and has limited uh, experiences to draw upon, yeah. right? So, but I believe that that, that really Enzo is the glue that, mm, uh, that, that brings it all together. We're all dog lovers at some point. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're all dog lovers. Well, I mean, to, just because there's a this uh, the idea of, of of unqualified, unconditional love, mm -hmm. you know, with our pet, with our pets, with our dogs especially. I'm a dog guy, so you know, with our dogs, we we have this, we have no conditions on on the love. We want mm. we want to be with them. They want to be with us. They don't they don't ask much from us. We don't ask much from them. You know, don't eat anything too expensive, and you know, do your business outside and. <laughs> And, and they, they, you know, some nice fresh water, some food, and a tennis ball, and we're good to go, right? So with the people around us, we have a lot of uh, conditions that we put on the love that we give to them. Well, if you don't treat me this way, then I'm not going to do this. Or if you mm -hmm. talk to me like this, then I'm going to act like this. And so rather than uh, put all these conditions on the human relationships we have, maybe I think we should uh, treat each other more like dogs. It's a good in a good way. By, yeah. <laughs> it, it's an interesting idea to sort of have a dog as a centerpiece of a story. And I'm wondering sort of how you went about approaching that because, as you said, we're very passionate about, you know, animals and stuff like that. And it feels like it's one of those things that's so delicate of a balance that you have to like, you know, you can't do these to the animals or people are going to get upset or, yeah. you know, you don't want to do all these sort of things. That It's sort of like, how was that process of finding like the right balance of this character in terms of creating a unique interesting character but at the same time not doing something that's going to set off people or turn them off too early or abruptly or sort of lead them through that story yeah that's a that is an, a question with a great deal of nuance if i might say oh, i don't doubt it yeah. <laughs> I have no doubt. um one has to follow one's instinct and then one has to do due diligence, you know, in, in, for, for that specific thing. You know, look, there's some stuff in there that I caught some flack for um, that uh, I didn't really think too much about necessarily or think that it would offend anyone. Enzo makes a, in his narration, makes an offhanded comment about... Um, you know, dogs uh, whose hips fail them and they have to go around in a little dog mm. cart for the mm -hmm. rest of their life. And it's sort of a derogatory thing. So he doesn't want to undergo that indignation. He's, he sees it as an indignation. And I, I, I did get uh, uh, emails from people who said that they highly disagreed with my assessment of that. And what could I do except say, yeah, that wasn't me, that was Enzo. <laughs> That's a good scapegoat. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, yeah. I totally threw him under yeah, the bus. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there, there is that. Um, but I think that... I mean, look, the bottom line is if we're if we treat each other like with respect, then we don't offend people. Right. And sometimes humor has to get close to that line without going over it. And I think that for the most part, um, a, 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 a well, uh, a thoughtful person can put together something that is entertaining and funny and does not offend 
great portions well, it's, of the it's population. A, well, there's a couple levels there. You're right, like in terms of what like a dog can do that a human can't, but also just like in terms of having an animal as a character. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm like, what are like we most passionate about as an, a nation? It's like religion, yeah. dogs, yeah, like yeah. everything else. So it's like, you mistreat a dog, people are going to be upset. Like, if a dog is here, you're going to be upset. It's just one of those things that like, I, I, I'm thinking about, you know, like, Old Yeller, all these films that have so much baggage. Like, I, I, I think about, for me, Turner and Hooch. Mm -hmm. I saw that as a kid, and I literally turned to my parents, and I was like, I can't believe you guys show me a dog snuff film. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> that's right, the way right, I described right, right, it. Right. It was sort of like this traumatic moment. What is it sort of like, as yeah. an author, like, you're, okay. you're, you want to use this as a backbone of a story, sure. but at the same time, you know, it's a very delicate thing that people take very personally because yeah. pets are something that we all have. That's and all right. Love and all yeah, that. no, no, I, I totally understand. And and here's the thing: is that a, a book is a control, a, a novel is a controlled, or a movie is a controlled environment where you are putting characters through their paces, and there have to be um, difficulties and obstacles to overcome. If there mm. weren't any obstacles, it would not be a drama, right? And so, therefore, there has to be jeopardy involved yeah. as part of the nature of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And if people can't get with that, then they should not read. Look elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I don't fair. know. I mean, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair point. Yeah. All right. Um, what is the process like in terms of uh, watching this transition from a literary medium to mm -hmm. a film medium? I'm, I'm thinking about this just. I mean, there's one scene that's clearly CGI. I mean, maybe other ones that use some CGI here and there. But I'm also thinking just purely from the practical standpoint of like, you're writing a book with an animal. You can literally do anything that you want. You don't have to worry about like what dogs can do in terms right. of like physical training, et cetera. And now you have to transition, transition this into a world where that is actually a legitimate concern. Like, what can we get this dog to do? Right. Is, is that something that you thought about as this was processing into a film? Was this something that um, actually had an impact in terms of trying to craft the arc for a film? Yeah. Like, what was, what was that sort of process well, I, like? That wasn't really, I wasn't really involved in that part of the process. Though I do have some insight into it, because I was curious the same way yeah. that you are about it. But, you know, I, I really sort of... Uh, early on, stepped back and let the filmmakers do their thing. Um, Very bold for like a writer. Like it feels like that's one of those things. Like I don't want to say it's your baby, but it's one of those things that it feels like you've spent years working on, and to hand it off to someone else and be like. Good luck. Like, is, well, is, that is very that is a uh, a very generous way of looking at it. The more cynical way, I think, would be um, it, if it. If I step back and they screw it up, I can just point my finger at them. It's a great say, strategy as well. I respect that. Yeah, it's not, it's not a bad strategy. On the, on the other hand, I don't get credit for it, so I don't want to try and take credit for something I didn't. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't do. That being said, um, you know th that that is an issue when you start working with a dog, for instance, in a film. How do you get the dog to do what you want the dog to do? Well, dogs are trained pretty well, and they're they're very intelligent beings, as we know. But still, what Simon Curtis told me about that process is get tons and tons and tons of footage. Mm. Because then in the editing process, you can kind of build um, the reactions that you want the dog to have from the footage that you have available. So rather than put too much expectation on the dog, just capture the dog in every possible mode and then use what you need to use. And you probably can do a certain amount of it with narration as well, I imagine. Where oh, well, it's like sure. a dog staring off into the distance and you're like, well, okay, in this scene he's yeah, right, thinking right, right, this. Right, right, and right. You're just like, right. Yeah, you, with one narration it's like, and the greatness of mankind's journey through time. And then in the other narration, it's like, I'm freaking hungry. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. Totally yeah. Sways Absolutely. No, narrate. Well, the benefit of, of this film is that it is narrated, the story is narrated by the dog. And therefore, having Kevin Costner do the dog's voice is fantastic because you can, exactly, you can, you can do, it's sort of like the old Kino Eye experiment, the Russian filmmaker experiment of the, the picture of the, the footage mm -hmm. of the guy, and then they show an apple pie and people say, oh, he's hungry. Mm -hmm. And then the picture of a guy and, and a chainsaw, and he's like, oh, he's about to kill people. You know, yeah, same yeah, expression, yeah. same footage. Yeah. And so that's sort of a thing that yeah, I'm sure music, was used. Yeah, all that other stuff comes in there as well. You're right. totally right. Um, one interesting thing that you mentioned at the Q&A last night that I sort of want to touch upon is that you said you worked on a, a short film, I believe, that went to the Academy Awards. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I think you said you won, too. Yeah, we would, um, uh, yeah. Was that prior to you sort of really digging into writing? I was just kind of curious what that experience, and yeah. also working in documentaries, or was it documentaries? Yeah, I made documentaries. Um, 
had on you as a writer and sort of coming full circle in terms of like how you crafted storytelling and how that impacted your perspective as you headed back around to making it into a film? Yeah, it's, it, so what happened was I, I always wanted to be a, a writer or at least a storyteller and uh, went to college and got a degree in English and then I was so sick of writing essays in blue books. I went insane. So I went to film school, to grad school in film. Mm -hmm. To uh, I thought I would do screenwriting. It didn't work for me. I had kind of an allergic reaction to screenwriting. Huh. I, I couldn't deal with the, the medium. So I started doing producing and uh, documentary film work and stuff. And a classmate of mine, Adam Davidson is his name. He directs a lot of television down in LA. He said, could you produce my thesis project for me? And so I worked with him together. We, I co-produced it with him. And uh, got nominated for an Academy Award in 1991, it was called The Lunch Date. You can find it on YouTube. Fantastic. And it won, uh, won the statue, and it was pretty, pretty awesome. And it was very, very great for him. He was the guy. It was his. He wrote and directed it, and it was mm -hmm. his deal. But you know, I was a part of the whole process, and it was a lot of fun. Then I made a documentary film. I started just doing my documentary film work, working for myself and for others. And the way I've looked at it is, I was telling, like, I wasn't mature enough as a person or as a writer to be able to write my own stories yet from scratch. Yeah. So I was documentaries for me was telling stories using found objects. Like it's interesting. Bits yeah. of archival footage or photographs or interviews and then piecing it together, but it still has to have a dramatic structure to be compelling, right? You have yeah. to have an issue or a protagonist, and there has to be a, a need, a goal, and there have to be obstacles, and then there has to be a resolution. It's real simple. But is there like, I don't know, I, don't, I hate to say the word simplicity, that it, you, you when you look at like turning a, a book into a film in terms of distilling the most important aspects. Because I think about this most notably for me in terms of like Michael Crichton. Mm -hmm. I read Jurassic Park mm -hmm. and there are literally pages in the book that are just binary code. And then you look at The Lost World, which he wrote after the first film came yeah. out, and it's a much more streamlined novel. It's clearly something you can sort of see in your mind as like a screenplay. Yeah. Is, is that something you just you think about in terms of like, I want to make this more accessible should it transition to it? another medium or is that something you don't even think about and you're just like I'm gonna write my story whatever becomes of it after that is is not a concern to me or well the the latter is what I feel um, there has never been there's not a sequel to the art of racing in the rain and I can't imagine there ever will be one um, because I don't think life always has to be filled with sequels oh 100% right. so yeah. you know so do I think um, I'm never really thinking about what's going to happen. I, I'm thinking about writing something that resonates so deeply within me mm. that I, it has to come out and that I want it to come out in a way that it will resonate with someone who picks up the book and reads it. That's and that, that's, that's as simple as it is. I mean, that's all I want is to, yeah. I want one person who isn't my mother or my wife to be able to resonate with the story. And if I can do that, then I've done the right thing. Now, I've had that happen with a book that sold 800 copies, and I've had that happen with a book that sold 6 million copies. I, I kind of like the 6 million copy version. If I can do that again, sure, that would yeah, be awesome. Sure, totally. <laughs> and sort of one other question on the topic, um, to sort of wrap this up. I was just kind of curious, now that this has been made into a movie, and you look at it from a different lens, sort of stepping away from yeah. the one you had, is there anything you look at that and you're like, gosh, I wish I had done it that way in the book, or looking at it, stepping back, like, I wish I had done this so it could be in the film? Yeah, there's one thing, there's only one moment that I can really think about, that, that, and it, I don't want to do too, a spoiler here, sure. but there will be, a, several years ago, I think in 2011, um, a local theater company, uh, Book It Repertory Theater, mm -hmm. made a play version of The Art of Racing oh, the Rain, wow. and it was fabulously done. David Hogan is this actor who oh, yeah, played Enzo. Hogan. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he did a great job being Enzo, and it was this whole, and they did a fun job, and it was really, crowd pleasing, you know, and it yeah. was very generous of the studio to give them permission to do that, by the way, so thanks to the studio. <laughs> uh, but at the end of that, the ending of that was was perfect. They did a clever little thing of this reveal of this little boy in Italy that was smarter than what I did in the book. And I've always thought, and if I ever if I could go rewrite that epilogue of the book, I would I would use their their way of doing it. I don't think mine's bad, but it's just doesn't quite it goes up to 11 if you go did the hey, you know, if, if you can improve something you work on, like, I definitely appreciate that idea of, like, just let's add this to the thing. Let's yeah. just make it a little bit better. It's, it's fun. Very cool. Well, the film is The Art of Racing in the Rain. Comes out today, August 9th. That's right. Just there make we go. sure that's clear this time. <laughs> we got it down now. Um, 
fantastic film. I wish you the best of luck with Thanks. this in the theater, and I can't wait to see what you bring out next to us. Great. Thanks awesome. so much. Thank you so much. The wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, because I've got space game and it feels alright.